Hello traders, it is Friday, October the 11th. This is John Kicklighter, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com. Here to give a market wrap up for this past 24 hours of trade. And more importantly, an outlook for what we can expect in the final 24 hours of trade ahead. But before we dive into the conversation of what lies ahead, just give 10 seconds if you could to read through the disclaimer. And once we go through that, we will dive right into what's happening in the markets. Okay, with that out of the way, let's take a look at what's happened in the past 24 hours to inform us how we should prepare for our final trading day. Now, I am certainly a pessimist when it comes to what happens in the markets, the outlook, and uh, the presumption that complacency can maintain the kind of stability that we've come to expect in these markets over the past decade. Uh, but I'm also a pragmatist. And if I know that there is a certain amount of restricted time that we're dealing with, that lack of time can create scenarios, situations in which the, the probabilities of a significant swing, even if it suits the unreasonable big picture, uh, can become improbable for generating significant traction. Uh, in this case, I'm actually looking at a, uh, at a I don't want to say preference, but a, a, a lean towards a, a buoyancy for risk trends, simply because we are running out of time before the end of the week uh, and to gain material traction of these uh, various fundamental themes that we see continuously uh, plague sentiment. So taking a look at risk trends, uh, and we'll talk about the themes that are dictating the moves, you can see that this past session we had a significant bounce in the S&P 500. Now, of course, a lot of what's happening nowadays is actually outside of the U.S. active session. So if you're trading uh, with this as a benchmark, as I like to do, uh, you need to look at some of those measures that are in, uh, are more global oriented in timing. So they're not, uh, uh, they're not disposed to the same open and close as the cash market, which is extremely limiting why you get some, some ignore, enormous gaps from day to day. You can see from the E-mini e futures, the S&P 500's uh, principal futures contract, that there is a, a, a more pronounced rally and even some after hours climb as well. There's the 15 minute chart. You can see a little bit of follow through. And what does this follow through come on? Uh, no surprise, it's what you guys called and you de uh, the majority definitely uh, was proven correct this week. It was trade wars was the number one concern. Growth as a major theme, while it still is a close second and trade wars are interpreted through, uh, through uh, the expectations of what kind of economic impact it's going to have, I think people are still principally concerned with the, the headlines that it represents. Uh, just looking for trade wars, good, bad, doing a binary assessment of headlines or social media trends, and then uh, projecting their views, whether it be through risk assets, whether that be through more targeted uh, currency crosses, uh, USDCNH or AUSD, or whatever other benchmark uh, seems to be more appropriate. But you definitely have a fairly strong sentiment move this past 24 hours. Uh, the S&P 500, this is the emerging market ETF, the EEM, the high yield fixed income, a lot more reserved carry trade, uh, certainly outperforming, not necessarily only due to uh, the improvement of sentiment uh, through trade in, in, in considerations, but certainly there and, and, and prominent. Uh, but uh, rest of world equities, the VEU, and I think it's really worthwhile looking at the global picture of equities as an asset class rather than just breaking it down regionally. The S&P 500 deviates quite far from the rest of the world. How far? The S&P 500 versus the rest of the world offers you a, a general trend like that. That's the ratio. Clearly an enormous difference in their general bearing and perspective. All right, so it's, it's important to get a all-world view of equities that doesn't get that kind of skew. But risk on through this past uh, session. It can carry through to the Friday session because we don't have a critical make or break sentiment. In fact, if you're looking at the ACWI, the All World Equity Index, it's in the middle of its range. It's just as easy to advance as it is to pull back. 
this is there is no preference for path of least resistance. They're both fairly low boundary. So a speculative swing in sentiment is not difficult for a benchmark like this, but it's not just the, the broad perspective of global equities. U.S. equities are in the same boat. You can still have a risk aversion and it not represent a critical breakdown, a wholesale shift in favor of the bears. But a, an advance doesn't really change the perspective either. Although on a shorter time frame chart, you have some series of descending highs. So it would carry, if I saw a break to the upside, let's say I'm on, uh, on Friday's open, I would say there's probably a lot behind that theme. Not enough to get you a new, a new record high, much less continue beyond it. But it would insinuate that there's probably going to be enough risk appetite that it will carry through to the rest of the world or the rest of the global risk assets and wherever you think that that might translate into some uh, some greater opportunities. So for some of these yen crosses in particular, dollar, yen, euro, yen, uh, that could be quite interesting. All right, It still would take a lot to make something, uh, a material technical setup like this to really offer follow through on a Friday. Remember, it's a very truncated session. Everyone knows liquidity is going to drain by the end of that day. And then <laughs> weekends are the Wild West nowadays. You have a lot developing through the weekends, unexpected. And we've had some very substantial gaps from Friday to Monday uh, these past months. So it would take a lot. And I don't think people are going to be willing to really hold an outsized position over a potentially tumultuous weekend. So whatever you see in risk trends is probably going to be opportunistic unless something systemic changes. So principle, uh, expect from the themes volatility, set a very high bar for expectations for a significant move. So a significant move would be a break to the upside on the uh, euro yen or the dollar yen or any other yen crosses uh, with any kind of meaningful follow through. You probably have to wait until Monday or Tuesday to get not just the break, but genuine follow through if you have a risk on bearing. And that's a lot to ask for over the weekend. Not impossible. Not impossible. There are a few things that uh, could actually achieve this. One of them, and, and we are seeing it absolutely in effect this past session, is the improvement or the perception of improvement in trade wars. Now, we still have lingering uncertainties and issues around what's happening between the U.S. and the EU. If you recall, last week, uh, the United States took the WTO's uh, allowance for seven and a half billion worth of, uh, of tariffs against Europe for its uh, Airbus ruling very seriously. They went for tariffs on imported European uh, airplanes, as well as uh, agricultural and industrial goods, 25%. That is just a that is a trade war waiting to happen. It hasn't erupted yet because Europe is hoping for some diplomacy. They already are fighting the UK. They don't want to have to get involved in this because they're also facing a very uh, pressurized economic backdrop where it looks like they're borderline recession, a warning that's been issued by the World Bank, the IMF, and even from Europe, the Eurozone officials, so like the ECB. So they don't really have a, a great interest in fighting a new trade war against the United States. But if push comes to shove, they really have no other option. Really, the focus right now on, on trade is through the U.S. and China. Uh, and that has been 15 months of just escalating pain. But there's always little slivers of, uh, uh, of enthusiasm that come through the clouds. Uh, just really words, uh, rhetoric, never really action. They haven't really de-escalated their, their uh, efforts against each other, their tariffs against each other uh, since they began back in March 2018. Uh, but markets are more than happy to jump on any kind of voiced enthusiasm, though that responsiveness is waning. Uh, the markets really want to see genuine progress. Well, they did, however, respond to just stated enthusiasm. As you can see in the USDCNH, a nice bounce there uh, this past session. And I think a lot of the after hours move uh, and general bounce and risk trends uh, from the likes of the S&P 500 here, the in many futures, was really fostered by the discussions around trade. What was the, the headlines? Well, there were many and they were, they were very uh, back and forth. The general concern 
was that the Chinese delegation was going to leave early, uh, that they would not hang around, they would leave a day early because they didn't think that the U.S. was coming to negotiate. But this past session, uh, President Trump suggested that the the discussions were going well. That Vice Chairman, or sorry, Vice Premier uh, Liu He was actually going to stay and and meet the President on Friday. That's a high level conversation, which is usually a positive signal. Uh, if this is indeed going to lead to something more significant, there's even talk of a possible partial deal. Um, so not a full deal, but a partial deal to allow for some uh, benefit uh, to avoid. And this is very important, the October 15th escalation uh, in tariffs, because if, if this is not resolved, we are heading towards an October 15th, that's Tuesday, escalation in the tariff rate that the U.S. charges on a significant uh, portion of Chinese imports. That's a huge impact, and that's definitely going to be met with some degree of retaliation. Even if it's considered more negligence than active uh, effort, it is not going to be uh, responded to very well by the Chinese authorities. So Friday is kind of an important day. The problem is we see official headlines that can come. It can come tonight in the lead up to the U.S. session. It can also come after Friday's close. Would you want to hold a long risk trade, a significant long risk trade into the weekend, expecting or hoping really that the U.S. and Chinese officials uh, come to some agreement? I think that would be enormously risky. So consider your your approach to the risk carefully, very carefully. Another fundamental theme that uh, is <laughs> adding more weight uh, to the system and yet is being overlooked uh, because it's, uh, it's more convenient to just uh, uh, picture trade wars and ignore for the time being, uh, be complacent about the risks that we are uh, seeing in growth. All right. GDP this past session was a more targeted uh, risk from the UK. This was for August specifically, 0.1% contraction, though the year over year figure uh, and the aggregate for the quarter, it looks like it's going to avoid a recession, which is uh, struck the markets as positive. Really, it wasn't uh, positive because um, it really disappointed in terms of expectations. Uh, but the market in the, in the UK is certainly more distracted by other uh, matters. The pound actually had one of the biggest moves on the day, bar none, uh, in terms of the uh, scale of the, the rally. It was the biggest since March 14th, uh, obviously the peak that you had here in the cycle. Really extraordinary advance. Obviously, this was news driven and it was universal euro pound, pound yen and so on and so forth. Uh, I asked people what they thought their, their favorite was. I'm actually uh, more partial to pound CAD. You can get a little bit more volatility out of this as well. We'll talk about the Canadian dollar uh, as well uh, towards the end. But the sterling was responding to improvements, uh, perceptions of improvement in Brexit. Uh, there was a lot of suggestions, a lot of talk uh, that there was going to be a pared down free trade agreement. Um, there was uh, suggestions that the Irish uh, PM was warming to a possible deal. Obviously, Obviously, the Irish border is, is the most uh, uh, principal concern at this point. Uh, and there's even talk of, uh, uh, of Barnier and Barclays meeting on Friday uh, being a, a possible make or break scenario. So we'll see if that's indeed the case. But obviously, the markets are paying very close attention and they are very responsive to this. Brexit is an overriding theme. If you're looking for volatility, definitely watch the sterling into Friday's session. But in the meantime, that UK GDP figure was overlooked, conveniently so, because it just wasn't as important, nor was the trade balance, nor was the industrial production, nor construction output. That's just what the fundamental themes are. Now, we have other issues like the German trade balance, uh, which didn't necessarily hurt the euro, actually it didn't hurt the euro at all, uh, which is a key theme, uh, but it, it speaks to growth, especially with a drop of 1.8% in exports, not a big dry market mover, and even crude oil, uh, more responsive to the, uh, or even not even as responsive to this, uh, the drop in OPEC demand forecasts down third in a straight month, their, their growth forecast uh, for the world, 40,000 uh, uh, barrels per day or uh, dropping down to just under, or it's about 980,000 barrels per day forecast, uh, not even enough to pull, uh, pull uh, oil down. 
because it's more of a risk response. All right. Growth is going to be a much more principled theme next week because we have Chinese GDP. We have the IMF's update for World Economic Outlook. Watch those updates. Very important for the big picture, but for now, it's a secondary theme. We just have to go with what's moving the markets. Other themes, monetary policy, uh, the U.S. CPI figure uh, was generally overlooked. It was relatively in line, so not a lot there. 2.4% headline, 1.8% I believe uh, in the, or 1.8% in headline, sorry, 1.7% in headline, core is 2.4%. Not enough there to really foster expectations for a Fed uh, rate cut. That didn't hurt, that didn't help the dollar though. Uh, instead, we were looking uh, at the ECB, which, interestingly enough, the minutes that we had, the ECB minutes, uh, were very dis uh, disconcerting, more so because they reflect the, what we've been talking a lot, a lot here, the ineffectiveness of monetary policy. There's a rift in the ECB's monetary policy stance. Some are very ardently dovish, some are very ardently hawkish, and that creates a problem about how to employ monetary policy in an effective way. This is the world's second largest central bank. Do not underestimate what this means for the global markets. It certainly is a problem for the euro, though you wouldn't know it from the actual euro's performance here. Actually, if you look across all the euro crosses, not just the euro, dollar, euro, pound, euro, yen, but uh, others like the euro Aussie and a, a more straightforward assessment euro swiss uh the euro is a little changed on the day if you do an equally weighted index on it i'd watch the euro very closely in the upcoming session i think the german uh credit rating standard and poor's is going to issue its credit rating on germany it's the largest economy in the uh in the eurozone watch that that's very important uh, but monetary policy is still crucial still responsive to these big picture fundamental themes like growth like trade wars uh, but for now it's in the back of the market's mind even next week when we talk about the IMF's updates, probably going to be secondary, if even <laughs> registering. Now, other key events risks that I'd be much more interested in, you have the U.S. Consumer Confidence Report, the University of Michigan Consumer Confidence. This can touch upon trade wars. This can touch upon growth. This can touch upon stability of financial markets. Watch it very closely. The U.S. consumer is the largest uh, net consumer in the world. So versus businesses, versus central banks, versus all these other big picture consumers. U.S. consumer is the largest. Their confidence is extraordinarily important uh, to the big picture. I would also point out very, uh, very interesting in terms of uh, market moving potential is going to be the Canadian dollar. Uh, we have the Canadian employment statistics, uh, which can cater to some interesting uh, Canadian dollar setups, uh, though we're still a little bit away from the immediate technical boundaries. But be mindful, uh, you have a strong outcome from the Canadian jobs figures, and it can lead to some volatility, short-term breakouts, maybe even some short-term reversals. It certainly helped out the Australian dollar, which had a strong rally in response to the Australian consumer inflation expectations figures, which jumped from 3.1 to 3.6%, a fairly impressive move, but it doesn't really turn the trend around for this battered currency. All right, keep a tab on the immediate event risk, but put into the hierarchy the themes. Follow the themes, recognize that we're leading into the end of the week. Saturday will drain all liquidity, and next week is loaded for event risk, and we will carry over the weekend with uncertainties, particularly in trade wars. So be on the lookout and don't take unnecessary risks. Okay. We'll wrap it up here. We'll do our final rundown of these markets and more importantly, an outlook for next week uh, tomorrow. Until then, I wish you all good luck trading out there.